Welcome to the de Havilland Aircraft Museum. In the early days of aviation, it was just as important to have the right engine as it was to have the right airframe for your aircraft. And the right engine had to be powerful enough, it had to be lightweight enough, but it also had to be reliable. So Geoffrey de Havilland, like a lot of the pioneers, actually designed his own engines. So for example, if you take the biplane number one, that was powered by an engine designed by Geoffrey de Havilland himself and built by a company called Iris. And we're very fortunate that we have a replica of that engine here in the museum. So this is a replica of the engine first built in 1909, used in the very first aeroplane that he designed and then later used in biplane number two as well. And so that was the start of engine manufacturer for de Havilland. Subsequently, Geoffrey de Havilland joined Airco during the First World War and he designed planes such as the BE-2, the DH-2, DH-4, DH-5 and DH-9. These planes designed for Airco were typically powered by engines by Rolls-Royce and other manufacturers. Following the end of the First World War, Geoffrey de Havilland and colleagues founded the de Havilland Aircraft Company. Their aim was to go into the civilian market. So the 1920s was the era of new fashions, new music, new hobbies. And foremost amongst those hobbies was aviation. Everybody who was everybody wanted to learn how to fly. And the British government made that a little bit easier because what they would do is subsidize each flying school. They would be given enough money that they could buy one aeroplane. And for everybody whom they taught, they would also get a further subsidy as well. And the majority of these new flying schools would purchase one aircraft, the de Havilland Moth. The Moth was successful because it was easy to make, easy to fly, and it had a reliable engine. And for that engine, Geoffrey de Havilland turned to a friend of his, Frank Halford. Geoffrey de Havilland and Frank Halford had met each other before the First World War. Frank Halford had worked for Harry Ricardo, who was one of the foremost engineers in his field. Frank Halford's solution to de Havilland's problem was ingenious. He was able to procure spare parts from old Renault V8 engines. Taking those parts, he designed an engine called the Cirrus. The Cirrus was a four-cylinder, air-cooled, upright engine with the propeller connected to the crankshaft. Just what de Havilland needed. Thanks to the Cirrus, de Havilland took off as a manufacturing company. And it was all down to Frank Halford. There was one problem, however, with the Cirrus engine. It was built from spare parts and they began to run out. So popular did the moth become. So Frank Halford was approached again to design an engine that would be used exclusively by de Havilland. And for that specification, he designed this engine, the famous Gypsy engine. The Gypsy engine was mated to the moth airframe and this became the famous Gypsy Moth. This is the aircraft that's familiar to people who follow Francis Chichester, Mary Bailey, Amy Johnson, Alan Cobham, and so many other pioneers. They made use of the Gypsy-powered Moth. There was, however, a problem with the Gypsy engine. The cylinders were upright and they intruded in the line of sight of the pilot. If you have a look at a photograph of the DH-71, for example, you can clearly see the pilot can't see very well. So Frank Halford's next stroke of genius was to design this engine. This is the Gypsy 3, which first saw service in the Puss Moth. The Gypsy 3 is an inverted Gypsy engine. If you look at the majority of propeller-driven aircraft in the museum, 
you'll notice they all have a very, very similar shape. The top cowling is very smooth, leading to the propeller. Underneath, you typically have a cutout, and that is for the air cooling for the cylinders behind. This type of engine proved extremely popular, but more power was needed, so Frank Halford developed this engine here, which became the Gypsy Major. The Gypsy Major was produced in vast quantities. 14,000 of them were made. They were used by Osters, they were used by Miles, they were used by Percival, they were used by de Havilland. In fact, anybody who wanted to build a light aircraft and needed a reliable, powerful engine would go with the Gypsy Major. But time moved on and aircraft became bigger and required heavier loads, so more power was needed. One of the ways of addressing that was the Gypsy 31, which was a development engine designed to provide additional power over and above what the Gypsy Major provided. If you think that uh, the aircraft such as the DH-84 Dragon had two of the big Gypsy Major engines, how would you get additional power out of those engines? How would you get 50% more power, for example? The solution was very straightforward. You take the basic Gypsy Major design and you increase it to a six-cylinder engine. This is the Gypsy 6, a variant of which was known as the Gypsy Queen. By the time we're getting to the Gypsy 6, we're able to get something like 200 to 250 horsepower out of these engines, compared with 50 horsepower in the original Gypsy. The Gypsy 6 was used to power the famous Dragon Rapide, which we're actually restoring in the museum today. The Gypsy 6R was also used to power the DH-88 Comet Racer, and you can see the green replica of that aircraft also at the museum. But things didn't stop there. It was necessary to build even more bigger engines. And one of the reasons for that was the DH-91 Albatross. This was a massive aircraft. It had a 100-foot wingspan. Built entirely of wood, like the later Mosquito, it was designed as an aircraft to go across the Atlantic, carrying mail and passengers. And for that, you needed something like 500 horsepower for each engine. So how do you get a 500 horsepower engine out of the Gypsy 6? The answer, you build the Gypsy 12. The Gypsy 12, also known later on as the Gypsy King, was a 12-cylinder inverted air-cooled engine, and it was used for powering the famous DH-91 Albatross in the late 1930s. So, so far we've moved from the 20s into the 30s. Let's move into the 1940s. And in 1942, in Hatfield, the local residents used to complain because there was a lot of noise coming out of the factory. De Havilland said, well, that's just another generator. In fact, they were building this. This is the de Havilland Goblin jet engine. It's built on similar principles to the one that Whittle was designing, although there were changes into the way the combustion chambers worked. It was the Britain's first type approved jet engine. It was exported, amongst other places, to Lockheed in America. And this was the engine that powered the original Meteor prototype because the Rolls-Royce Welland engines were not yet available. And in 1943, at the height of the Second World War, off the grass airstrip in Hatfield, the prototype flew of the DH Vampire jet, which you can also see at the museum. That was Britain's first single jet interceptor. So we've moved into the jet age. Not only did we have the Goblin in the jet age, but Frank Halford and his team developed it further into another engine known as the Ghost. And the Ghost engine was used to power the vampire's successor, the Venom. And you can see a Ghost and the Venom aircraft that it powered also at the museum. The Ghost engine was also used for civilian use as well. 
and four of those ghost engines were used to power the famous Mark I Comet, the world's first commercial jet airliner. So thanks to Frank Halford and his team, we've moved from basic propeller engines into the jet age and into the world's first commercial jet airliner. But what if we could somehow combine the benefits of a propeller and a jet? This is the H3 turboprop engine. It combines the benefits of a jet engine, but also has a propeller as well. A new generation of engines developed in 1946-47. This particular engine was tested at 500 horsepower, so it was as powerful as the Gypsy King. Unfortunately, development on this type of engine was curtailed by the cancellation of government contracts. So this particular engine type never saw any production quantity. As far as we know, this is the only engine in existence of this particular type. So we've moved from the 1920s to the 30s and 40s. Let's move on finally to the 1950s. And in the 1950s, the focus of every aviation expert was on supersonic flight, breaking the sound barrier. And this monstrous engine, an axial flow gyron jet engine with full reheat, able to generate 20,000 pounds of thrust, this engine was specifically designed for supersonic jet flight. So how come you've not heard of it? The answer, sadly, has to do with this aircraft here, the Hawker P1121. This was Hawker's contribution to supersonic jet aircraft and was designed to be the replacement for the famous Hawker Hunter. However, the government contract for the P1121 was cancelled and sadly, that aircraft never flew and therefore there was very little demand for the Gyron jet engine. However, that's not the final end of the story, because what we have here is the Gyron Junior. As its name suggests, this is a small version of the Gyron jet engine, typically only delivering seven or 9,000 pounds of thrust. This particular engine did see active service, and it was used in the famous Blackburn Buccaneer. Hopefully I've demonstrated to you that de Havilland not only built aircraft airframes, but also were very much pioneers in the engine manufacture side as well. When you do come to the museum, take a look not only at the aircraft themselves, but think about which particular engines were they using. Don't forget to check out our website for uh, when we're open, and we'll see you at the museum.